Principles are your life. That's the entire point of moral philosophy. The problem with anarcho-capitalists is that what we do is we say all states are evil and we leave it at that. They are mainly anti-state instead of being mainly pro-liberty. It's like saying to be a pacifist, I have to support some aggression. From an anarcho-capitalist perspective, it would take us nowhere. And I'm coming at you, Patrick, and I'm going to kill you. Greetings, philosophers. Welcome back to Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. I will once again be Patrick Smith. Today we have a special show for you. If it moves, privatize it. If it doesn't move, privatize it. And since everything either moves or doesn't move, privatize everything. A professor of economics at Loyola University in New Orleans, a senior fellow at the Mises Institute, maybe, we'll find out. Author of 500 articles, no. This is my old bio that I wrote for Walter. He's way over 500 articles at this point. It's probably approaching a thousand uh, articles in professional journals, two dozen books, a thousands of op-eds. Uh, Walter Block is a leading Austrian school economist and international leader of the freedom movement. That is guest number one for today. Guest number two for today is educated in economics, finance, and political economy. Our second guest has been published in multiple mainstream journals as well as the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, the Jerusalem Post, and more recently, he's co-authored several papers with Walter that have been quite controversial in libertarian circles his name is Alan Fuderman. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Thanks for being here. Thank you for, Thanks having, for having us. I, I hope that we can set an example with this discussion for all libertarians. Uh, we have a situation that I guess we can start by describing for people that aren't aware. Uh, I, I'll give the headline and then I'll maybe hand it to Alan to describe um, the timeline. So uh, Walter and Alan have co-authored several papers and articles that have been published in very prominent places that uh, called for some unlibertarian ends, let's say, that some people would describe as unlibertarian ends. Uh, Hoppe specifically. Uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe, uh, which is how I pronounce it, you can correct me if, if you know better, uh, has written some rejoinders, some rebuttals with very, very strong wording that has caused quite a stir, quite a bifurcation, quite a division in uh, libertarian thinker circles. And that's what we're here to discuss today. Alan, could you give us a flyover of the timeline of, of what's transpired? Well, we began our work on Israel with Walter, uh, basically in, I think, 2015, 2016, something like that. And the idea was to review and to answer Murray Rothbard's original paper from 1967 called War Guilt in the Middle East, where he blames the entire situation in the Middle East in general <laughs> to Israel, particularly with respect to the situation between Israel and Palestinian Arabs. Uh, and from that on, we worked in several uh, articles, uh, papers, and uh, a book that was finally published in 2021 called The Classical Liberal Case for Israel. Uh, and once uh, the October 7th massacre uh, took place, we uh, decided to work uh, in several articles and op-eds uh, presenting our viewpoint in defense of Israel and why Israel should destroy Hamas. Uh, basically, that was the story. And uh, afterwards, Hans Hermann Hoppe wrote uh, an open letter, uh, basically saying that Walter should be expelled from the libertarian movement because of his views on Israel. And uh, that was it, basically. I just wanted to add one thing. Uh, initially in 2015, 16, we had a third co-author, Rafi Farber, uh, who is a, a settler in um, Judea or Samaria. And I just wanted to acknowledge that he uh, played a small role in what Alan and I have been doing uh, subsequently. Okay, uh, um, I'm very familiar with Block. Block's been on this show and my other YouTube channel multiple times. Uh, Alan, could you maybe tell us about yourself so that we get to know who you are? Yes, well, I've done... Uh research and worked on subjects on economics 
micro, microeconomics, microeconomics, philosophy of economics, and particularly with Walter, we uh, we worked in many uh, different uh, war papers, you know, relating to different aspects, particularly on economics and libertarianism. And we published another book uh, that deals with uh, the Austro-Libertarian point of view, that's the name of the book, uh, in different subjects, that is methodology, epistemology, uh, microeconomics, macroeconomics, law, uh, and basically, yeah, public policy, different you know, perspectives on relevant subjects from the, the Austro-Libertarian uh, standpoint. And uh, basically that is my work in, in academia. Do you consider yourself an anarcho-capitalist like Walter? Yes, I do as an ideal. But uh, if you uh, have to analyze specific events and uh, uh, specific policies, then I think that you should uh, use anarchy as an ideal and um, you know free markets as a as a, another ideal in that respect and try to focus in what would be the closest that you could get in any specific instance. Interesting. Okay. Well, I mean, we're going to get to know all three of us better throughout the course of this conversation. Let's get into it. So the first. The first, the first thing I did, obviously, was read all of the material. I, re I read all of the um, links that you gave me, as well as some additional links to writings that you guys have both done. I've, I've read Hoppus critiques. I've read, there was another guy that did a critique that was published in, I think, the Libertarian Journal. I forget his name now. Um, David, David Gordon. Thank you, uh, David Gordon. So the first thing that stood out to me, and it was kind sorry, of... Sorry, was, let me interrupt again. David yeah, go ahead. Gordon had... Uh, a co-author, and I wanted to mention her also, Joya, who was David Gordon's co-author. Awesome. Okay. So the first thing that stuck out to me, like a massive red flare up into the air about a problem with the conversation that was going on, is that you guys wrote a book titled With Classical Liberalism in the Title. And multiple places in that book, you said we're writing from the position and the worldview of classic liberalism, not anarcho-capitalism. Then what happened next is you got a lot of criticism and a lot of critique from people saying, what is this ANCAP doing writing these things that are antithetical to anarcho-capitalism? These two, you know, it's oil and water. These views you can't mix. They do not mix. They're contradictory. And they criticize you from the position of anarcho-capitalism when that's what not what you were doing. So, Walter, if you could just briefly... And, and, and I have a bunch of quotes from your book to read, too, and, and I'll get to that shortly. But if you could just briefly maybe tell us why you wrote from a, a different point of view than the one you hold. What's the usefulness in it? Uh, and then I'll read some quotes from the book and maybe get your responses. Well, I don't know if I can do it briefly, but I can do it. Oh, well, do uh, it then. Do it long form. I, I'm here all day. <laughs> the, the main reason was to be responsive. Uh, to the article of Murray Rothbard that Alan mentioned, War Guilt in the Middle East. I think it came out in 1967. Um, what Murray said is the problem with anarcho-capitalists is that what we do is we say all states are evil, which is true enough from, uh, from the anarcho, from the ANCAP point of view, and we leave it at that. And Murray challenged us anarcho-capitalists to do better, to um, uh, distinguish between some states, all of which are evil, and other states, all of which are evil, and uh, distinguish between them and say which are more evil. Well, once you, uh, ha once you do that, you can't be an ANCAP, because an ANCAP says that all states are evil, and Murray is specifically challenging us to say, well, which ones are worse? So if all we do is say, well, this is a state, therefore it's no good, that's a state, therefore it's no good, uh, period, well, then we're what Murray called sectarians. You know, the, the state is evil, period. And we wanted to um, adhere to his challenge. Interesting. And, and um, the way I see the libertarian movement is really composed of four parts. Uh, the first part is um, anarcho-capitalism, and that, that is the most... Uh, how shall I say, consistent, logically consistent principle uh, or rather perspective 
compatible with what libertarianism is all about. And what is libertarianism all about? It's about three things. One, the non-aggression principle, namely, uh, it shall be illegal to initiate violence. Secondly, private property rights. You have to have private property rights because if I, I'm now admiring your headphone and if I just grab that headphone, uh, am I a criminal or not? Well, uh, did I violate the non-aggression principle? Well, we have to have a theory of who owns that, uh, that headphone. And the libertarian view is for unowned property. It's based on homesteading and uh, otherwise uh, based on anything voluntary like buying and selling and renting and gambling. And the third one is free association. No one should be compelled to associate with anyone else. Well, if you take that strictly speaking, government is uh, illegal because it compels you to pay taxes and you haven't agreed to pay taxes. So, um, so I would say uh, anarcho-capitalism is the highest level of libertarianism in the sense that it's the most compatible with libertarian theory. Second on in the batter's box or in, in the hierarchy would be minarchism, minimal government libertarianism. And, and the person most associated with ANCAP would be Murray Rothbard, of course. The people most associated with um, minarchism would be Ayn Rand and Robert Nozick. And here the idea is Government is legitimate, but it's very, very limited. And it, the only goal of government is to protect the uh, citizens. And to that end, you only need three institutions, armies to keep foreign, foreign bad guys off of us, police to keep local bad guys off of us, and courts to determine who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. The next level below that would be uh, constitutionalism in the United States and the most uh, person, the most famous associate with that would be Ron Paul. Why is this a little lower level? Because in the Constitution, in addition to armies, courts, and police, it allows for post offices and post roads and a few other things. The next level below that would be classical liberalism and the most famous people associated with that would be Milton Friedman and Friedrich Hayek. And there it's armies, courts, and police, and roads, and, and post offices, and a few other things as well. And we decided to take that lowest level because um, 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 uh, uh, Milton Friedman and Friedrich Hayek are perhaps the most famous um, uh, theoreticians of this sort of a thing. And, and we thought that that would be the most conducive because Israel is not... Um, uh, and cap and Israel is not monarch and minarchist and Israel is not constitutionalist but Israel well not so much uh, <laughs> at its inception which was socialism but with the Likud party they're much more free enterprise much more classical liberal uh, than they otherwise would be so that's why we chose as the title for uh, this book of ours that I keep waving around the classical liberal case and the problem that we have with Hans Hoppe is that a lot of times what he'll do is uh, say, well, the, the Israeli case is um, very bad, or the Israeli case is imperfect, or very, very bad. But he, but he never says, well, how about the other case? Uh, how, how good is that? And what Murray Rothbard is asking us to do is to weigh the two of them together to see which of them is closer to um, classical liberalism or libertarianism in general. Alan, do you, uh, you want to add on uh, to what I said? I think that in order to, to put the same thing, but from a different perspective, you could see that we included in our reply to Hoppe uh, a quote by Steve Horwitz that says that many libertarians, uh, the framework that they use is that they are mainly anti-state instead of being mainly pro-liberty. And so I think that explains a lot with respect to this discussion, because when you say that you are pro-liberty, you have to analyze specific cases on a comparative basis. But if you say that you're anti-state primarily, then you'll be against all states, no matter what. But that would be the sectarian view that uh, Murray Rothbard rejected when analyzing the same subject that we are analyzing. So uh, keep that idea in mind. Being anti-state is not necessarily the same as being pro-liberty because in some places, the disappearance of a state does not guarantee an increase in liberty. 
although that may sound paradoxical, but it, it certainly is the case uh, in this particular uh, subject in the Middle East. Well, I find that extremely debatable. I think that being pro-liberty entails being anti-state. I don't think you can be for liberty and be for a state at the same time. Uh, you, you can't, it's like saying to, to be a pacifist, I have to support some aggression. No, We're not speaking not, English here. No, no, no. no. <laughs> it, 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 uh, even if you, if let's let's take your own example. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to support aggression. You have to support self defense, for example, uh, in order to promote peace, right? Uh, so no, I, I wouldn't. I, I don't agree with that. Now, if you're going to say that being uh, in favor of a particular state from the anarchist perspective is going to be a sort of a contradiction that is true but we are not taking that approach we are analyzing on a comparative basis well let me try to be the mediator here i, <laughs> I think that <laughs> I, I think that patrick is right from an ancap point of view uh, that, here we are uh, yeah go ahead sorry on the other hand i think alan is correct from a classical liberal point of view, and that's the point of view from which we are approaching the, the Israeli situation. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, Walter, I'm ahead, Walter Mater. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Yeah, I mean, Patrick, think, think about it this way. I mean, do you think that if the state of Israel disappears, you'll get anarcho-capitalism in the area? <laughs> that would be, uh, I think, a bit absurd to think that. Sorry. I I don't think if you got rid of any state in the world, you would get anarcho-capitalism in the current state of existence. No one, hardly anybody okay. knows what that even means at this point. So, okay, uh, okay. so let, let, let me read some stuff from various articles. So first of all, the abstract to your article says, starts with, and this goes to this weird, frustrating thing where you're being criticized for a position you weren't defending. You Your abstract begins with Block and Fuderman, Please tell me if I'm mispronouncing your last name. Um, okay. Block and Fuderman argue that the classical liberal political economic philosophy, <laughs> it's right there in the first sentence. Uh, in your book, I believe, uh, no, this was in your rejoinder, Hoppe partially entitles chapter 11 of his 1991 book, quote, on the errors of classical liberalism. We join him in this. We too are anarcho-capitalists, not classical liberals. However, for reasons explained below, the desire to become more relevant and to avoid sectarianism, to analyze and judge in a comparative basis a real world issue, we have adopted this perspective in our analysis. Furthermore, in another location, you, you quote Hoppe and then rebut him. You say, quote by Hoppe, in any case then, before this background, how is a libertarian to react and evaluate the 10-7 events? First off, he would want to wish the pox on the leadership of both gangs and on all gang leaders of foreign states that have lent and continue to lend support to either one of the two warring gangs with funds stolen from their own subject population. As well, he would acknowledge that the Hamas attack on Israel was no more totally unprovoked than the Russian attack a, while, a little while ago on the Ukraine. The attack on Israel was definitely provoked by the conduct of his own political leadership, much like the Russian attack on the Ukraine had been provoked by the leadership of the Ukraine. To which you guys respond, we wish he would stop his continual anarcho-capitalist sorties. <laughs> All three of us, Hoppe as well as the present authors, strongly agree with this position. It gets us nowhere and is a strong rejection of Rothbard's plea to leave off on this type of sectarianism. Is Hoppe hoping for a Nobel Prize in moral equivalence? Given his continual wishing up pox on the heads of both Hamas and Israel, we stand ready to nominate him for this honor. As for his mention of provocation, Bloch agrees with Hoppe on the Russian-Ukrainian war. Fuderman does not. Uh, and then in another location, the this is I, I, these are some of the quotes all surrounding this classical liberalism launching point. Quote, uh, the present authors, which you see on the screen, thanks for being here, have chosen to defend Israel on classical liberal grounds, the weakest category of libertarianism, since the most far removed from the purest version of this viewpoint, anarcho-capitalism. Why? Well, we most certainly could not have chosen anarcho-capitalism, even though we are staunch supporters of the Rothbard version of this perspective. Why not? To do so would have enmeshed us in the sectarianism against Rothbard. Over and over and over, you're pointing out that you're coming from a classical liberalism worldview 
in these p- critiques. Now, I could right now do a show defending anarcho-communism, and I could write an article saying the the commun the commie view, the filthy, disgusting communist view on the situation in Israel Palestine. I could do that, and you know maybe I could make valid points, but it would not be valid of other people to then criticize me for being a commie and for holding those views. It's this it's a weird thing that people ha- have done to you guys where you say explicitly this would be an argument if I was a classical liberal and then people are now criticizing you for being a classical liberal. Uh, I, I want to just really pound that home because it's really fundamental to all these claims that you guys are your libertarianism card has been revoked and you should be physically removed from the Mises Institute, uh, which I think happened, right, Walter? So uh, what are your thoughts? Have you been removed from the Mises Institute? And what are your thoughts on kind of that misunderstanding in their critiques? Well, uh, first of all, I have not been removed from the Mises Institute in the sense that I'm still welcome there, uh, that I uh, blog on lourockwell.com. Lou uh, sometimes uh, includes my articles, uh, not on Israel, but on other things. Uh, The uh, separation of me from the Mason Institute is a little different. It's not that I've been kicked out totally. It's rather that uh, I think ever since the inception, I've been called a senior fellow of the Mises Institute, which is an honor. And my senior fellowship has been removed from me. Uh, Tom DiLorenzo, the new president of the Mises Institute, wrote me a letter saying, because we disagree on war, uh, my views on war are too different from the Mises Institute's views on war, I'm no longer a senior fellow. But I'm still associated with them in the sense that I contribute um, uh, a little money and and certainly a a little ideological uh, uh, support. Um, But I disagree with Tom, who is sort of an old friend of mine, not only an old friend of mine, but an old family friend of mine. When my daughter was getting her PhD at Hopkins in um, Baltimore, he was in Baltimore teaching at uh, Loyola University, um, Maryland. Uh, He helped her. I I regarded him as a personal friend. He could have been nicer in demoting me. Uh, He could have said, well, you know, I don't really want to do it, but I have to, and, you know, something like that. But it was a very acerbic letter. Uh, and because we disagree on war, you're no longer a senior fellow, period. That would be my paraphrase. But we don't disagree on war. We agree on war, namely, uh, uh, offensive wars are evil and defensive wars are uh, legitimate. Uh, we only disagree on who's who in the case of Israel versus Hamas. Now, this other business beside the Mises Institute about people not understanding where we're coming from, They don't understand the word hypothetical. They don't understand the word arguendo. They don't understand the concept of assuming something is um, the case, which it's not, and proving that it's wrong. In in economics, one way to prove that indifference curves don't cross is to draw them crossing and then showing why that leads to a logical contradiction. I want to mention another area uh, where Ryan McMakin, another associate of the Mises Institute, uh, nastily and viciously attacked me on a totally different issue, namely the COVID um, uh, 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 shot, the, the vaccine for COVID. I once wrote, is there any case ever under any conditions where uh, we can compel people to get a vaccine, whether it's COVID or something else doesn't matter? And I came up with the following. Suppose you exhale, and when you exhale, 10,000 people die. Just suppose, arguendo, hypothetical. Would we then be justified in compelling you to take this vaccine, which has no bad effects? Well, yes, out of defense, because whenever you exhale, you kill people, uh, we got to stop you. And either you're going to take that vaccine or we're going to kill you. It's sort of like um, uh, a typhoid Mary. Typhoid Mary was working in a um, um, a restaurant and and she was giving people typhoid. Well, what should we do? 
Uh, should we let her just go there? No, I think as anarcho-capitalists or as libertarians or as uh, just uh, ordinary people, we have to say to her, look, you know, you go into a hotel, you go to your house, but you can't be here on, on this, um, uh, in this restaurant. Well, similarly, I, um, I, I see by your head shake, you disagree, but I think that in effect, you're a murderer if whenever you exhale, 10,000 people die. So I wrote saying uh, it would be justified uh, to compel you to have a vaccine. And if you didn't take the vaccine, uh, then uh, we should execute you. And do you know what Brian McMakin and, uh, and, and Tom DiLorenzo and a whole bunch of people said? They said that I favored actually uh, uh, executing people for not taking the COVID vaccine, which I never did. Let me give you just one more example. I favor voluntary slave contracts. And uh, Alan and I, I don't know Alan's view on this. We don't co-author on everything. Uh, here's the scenario. My son has a horrible disease and it'll cost $30 million to cure him. I don't have anything like $30 million. And uh, you, Patrick, are very rich. You're as rich as Bill Gates. And you'd like me to be your slave, come to your plantation, pick cotton, give you economics lessons. And if you don't like it, uh, you can uh, whip me or even kill me. This is the part and, of the show uh, where libertarians make a lot of friends. But yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, this is a <laughs> I, is a I know, I know, I know. Yeah. And, then, um, and I gain because I value my son's life more than my freedom. You gain, as in all voluntary contracts, because you value my servitude more than uh, the um, uh, money that you paid, the $30 million. Uh, so is this a valid contract? Now, among libertarians, it's a very debatable issue. The only one, I think, who really agrees with me on this is Robert Nozick. A whole bunch of people who disagree uh, disagree with me on this. Do you know what the New York Times did when I interviewed with them? They said I favored actual slavery. <laughs> now, this is an abomination. This is um, uh, as bad as Ryan McMakin and Tom DiLorenzo saying that I favored executing people for not taking the COVID vaccine. They, uh, and, and the similar thing with Israel. Namely, these people do not understand what arguendo means or what hypothetical means or any basic element of philosophy. It, it, it does strike me as absolutely invalid to eject you from the Mises Institute for writing from a position that that you don't hold uh, and when you admit and stand by a position that you agree with them on. Uh, now, like if I steel man their case, it's like, okay, if Walter has written 250 out of his thousand articles on classical liberalism, maybe we can start to question what his actual position might be. But to my knowledge, you've written a very small percentage of your work on classical liberalism, and you have written you have written vast quantities of words uh, uh, rebutting the foundational principles of the classical liberal position from an ANCAP perspective. You've rebutted yourself, and you stand by the rebuttals, not the classical liberalism. So where's the confusion? Is it just that we're not? Is it we're worried about? Is it that, and I'll kick this to you, Alan, is it that the majority of the population can't think in terms of hypotheticals, and so that makes appearances important, and be and the Mises wants to preserve its uh, reputation and appearance to a mass population of people that can't understand hypotheticals, so they have to go with that understanding? I'm trying to figure out what, what's going on here. What do you think? No, I think it's it's not about the philosophy or the. I think it's about the subject and the approach that we have in defense of Israel, because it's not classical liberalism per se. I mean, classical liberalism is uh, within the tradition of libertarianism as such, and it has many good. No, of course, no. Yes, barely. I, I, no, barely not. I mean, it, it, it is part of the tradition and it has a longer tradition than anarcho-capitalism itself, which has like, let's say, 50 years or so. Uh, although you may find uh, uh, specific authors in the 19th century, and but it was not uh, a very well-developed tradition until Mary Rothbard got to it. But you know who was a classical liberal? Uh, Ludwig von Mises. And the Mises Institute is named after von Mises as well. So, I mean, it's not about classical liberalism, the problem. It's about defending Israel. So I wouldn't frame it in the way you are doing it. 
So I was trying to be charitable to them and not may, and not say that their position is is colored, tainted, biased by Israel Palestine. Um, but you think it is. You think this is like if this were about two other countries that they wouldn't have um, had this reaction. Well, I don't know if, if, if it would be because uh, it's, uh, you know, I, I cannot make up uh, another case, but this is, this is about Israel and this is the reaction. So what else can I think? What do you think, Walter? Well, I, I agree with Alan, but I, I was interested in, in your head shake when I said that if you exhale, you kill 10,000 people uh, and, we, and, you, and you say we shouldn't stop that. But what's your view on I'm now exhaling? And I killed 10,000 people. Uh, you're going to let me get away with that? I, <laughs> that's I, I awesome. That's problematic. <laughs> that's why I'm a fan of yours, Walter, because you care about these arguments and you make them and you're not afraid of them. And that's why, if, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who don't know, I, I, I did the audio book for Defending the Undefendable 2. I'm a fan of Walter's. I love his writing. Uh, and one of the things Walter taught me, um, among many others, is that the question when it comes to analyzing these situations from a libertarian perspective is who owns the property. If you have a restaurant and somebody's sick inside of it, the only person it's up to as to whether or not that person can be on the property is the restaurant owner. If Typhoid Mary is in her own house on her own property, no, it is an unlibertarian thing to say, to say that we can go and accost her and and arrest her or prosecute her or much less shoot her if she's walking around on unowned property or public property or the tragedy of the commons areas no one has the right to accost her she has no greater or lesser property right to be there than anyone else even though she might be dangerous it's a a risk you take when you go on unowned commie property like the state's property um now I, I I, I still ahead. think that if she exhales and, and gives people typhoid, <laughs> we got to stop her. Well, like you would, it. you would agree that on your own property in your house, you could fill your house with poison, right? Absolutely. But as and, long as it doesn't impact other people, uh, but once she exhales on, on unowned property and, and what she exhaled now gets into somebody else's lungs, uh, uh, two hundred yards away, uh, that's a problem, and and we've got to address yeah. that. Let let me let me uh, just tackle one one point here that Walter will surely uh, agree, and he may develop even that uh, Murray Rothbard's view on externalities, particularly pollution, could be used as a as a proxy for for this particular subject uh, because. He, he held a different view than, for example, Ayn Rand on this issue. And it, it had to do with property rights. Yeah, Murray had a magnificent article uh, on air pollution. I think it was in 1962. Um, magnificent um, uh, analysis. Uh, the best analysis of pollution and externalities I've ever read. I, I will continue defending this position because I think this is a fun conversation. Let me know, though, if we're going to run out of time because I don't want to spend time on this if you guys are you know have a hard stop coming up soon, okay? No, let's get back to Israel. Oh, okay. All right. Fair enough. Um, happy to talk about this in another show sometime. That's It's really fun. Um, okay. So we had a... We had a question from a viewer that I think is on point and it will close out this discussion of um, classical liberal. Uh, the question was from Shepard. He says, he's wondering why one would argue from an inferior standpoint. Arguing from a classical liberal standpoint is like arguing from a bad math standpoint. While I know that three plus three equals six, I'm going to discuss math from the perspective of a person who thinks that three plus three equals five. That doesn't make sense to me. Uh, Alan, why don't you take that first and then and then Walter? Well, we, we tackle this issue, basically, because if we would analyze it from an anarcho-capitalist perspective, it would take us nowhere. I mean, what, what would you say? That uh, the state of Israel should disappear and uh, the, the, the quasi-state that Hamas imposed in the Gaza Strip should disappear? I mean, you may well like uh, listen to John Lennon's Imagine as well. And where, where would that take you? Nowhere. I mean, you need to analyze the situation from a, from a point of view that could actually lead to some specific policy recommendations or actual uh, realistic, uh, you know, things that could be done. Uh, otherwise, you end up being uh, irrelevant. 
This is precisely what Rothbard said, analyzing the same issue. It's not something that uh, we are making up. So, I mean, when Rothbard analyzes the situation, he, he, he is pursuing the same thing, only with a different uh, result or conclusion. Yeah, I, I agree with Alan um, fully. Um, we were trying to adhere to respond to Murray. Murray said, don't be a sectarian, uh, or don't only be a sectarian. Don't only say, yes, every state is evil. We know that uh, as ANCAPs, every state is evil. But we want to distinguish between some states and other states. And if we adhere strictly to anarcho-capitalism, we can't do that. We have to say Israel is evil, uh, Portugal is evil, Brazil is evil, Canada is evil, Hamas is evil, and leave it at that. And Murray challenged us to go further and say, well, who's more evil? Specifically, who's more evil, Hamas, uh, uh, Pal Palestinians, or the Israelis? So we have to, we can't use anarcho-capitalism if we want to distinguish between non-state entities. Uh, or uh, we want to uh, distinguish between states uh, to the degree of evil that they have. Yes, all states are evil, but Monaco is different than um, Nazi Germany. Uh, Monaco is not so bad. Nazi Germany was very bad. And, and we can't say that from, uh, from an ANCAP point of view because they're both states. I will defend Rothbard, the other side of Rothbard's argument, um, because we're we're you guys are really referencing Rothbard as the justification for your strategy. The other side, and, and he wrote this in an article called "The Case for Radical Idealism," which I think every single ANCAP needs to read, and I'm sure you guys have, where he talks about the two sides that are both broken, both the sectarians that will not accept any compromise, that it, it, they will only accept full whole hog solutions full whole hog libertarian end goals as anything as anything they would agree to uh, the entire state must be ended today or nothing the the all taxes must be reduced or uh, eliminated or nothing um and he rightfully and you guys are rightfully trying to stay away from that problem the other side of that that he also addresses in this amazing article is the pragmatist stuff when when people start talking about you get you're you're going to make yourself irrelevant you're you got to be in the real world you got to you know uh, you guys are too stuck in your principles to ever get anything done uh, you're you know you're making yourself irrelevant uh, these are the slogans of the other problematic side of this spectrum the pragmatists that also get nothing done because they they scuttle their principles in uh, in while striving for effectiveness, efficaciousness. Um, and I think the the actual strategy that Rothbard put forward is the middle ground between those two. And I'm calling it, I, I guess I'm making up a new word for it because he didn't name it, but I'm calling it principled incrementalism. And it, the, let me read two paragraphs from this article that I think address this conversation. He says, thus, the libertarian must never allow himself to be trapped in any sort of proposal for positive governmental action in his perspective the role of government should only be to remove itself from all spheres of society just as rapidly as it can be pressured to do so neither should there be any contradictions in rhetoric the libertarian should not indulge in any rhetoric let alone any policy recommendations which would work against the eventual goal thus suppose that a libertarian is asked to give his views on a specific tax cut even if he does not feel that he can at the moment call loudly for tax abolition, the one thing he must not do is add to his support of a tax cut su such unprincipled rhetoric as, quote, well, of course, some taxation is essential, etc. Only harm to the ultimate objective can be achieved by rhetorical flourishes which confuse the public and contradict and violate principle. So his strategy is... We should take from the, the pragmatists the successful strategy that is accepting every incremental step we can take towards liberty while also taking from the principled, um, uh, what was it, the uh, sectarians, let's say, the important lesson that we should never compromise on principle. What that means is, is like if a, if a tax reduction of 5% comes across our table, we sign that immediately. But... If a tax reduction of 5% comes, ac comes across our table that also includes a 2% tax increase in another area, sorry, we have to reject that. That violates our, our core principles. 
So now bringing this to this discussion of Israel and Palestine, I think what that means to us is we take every step towards killing the, the filthy, disgusting, heinous murderers that are Hamas that is possible that doesn't violate our principles. And by that, I mean killing a single innocent person. I think that is the clearest, best representation of, not, of the best strategy as well as Rothbard's strategy. I agree with him in that regard. Uh, let me go the other direction. Walter first and then Alan. What do you guys think? I disagree. Um, uh, there cool. is such a thing as collateral damage. Uh, whenever there's a war, there are going to be innocent people killed. And if we have the principle that you should never kill an innocent person, there can be no such thing as a defensive war. Now, Murray favored the uh, secession war of 1776 of the 13 colonies. He favored that war. Were there any innocent people killed in the whole course of that um, war? Of course there were. And if you're going to say that you shouldn't do anything where even one single solitary innocent person dies, well, then there can be no such thing as defensive war. Now, the Hamas makes it infinitely worse because what Hamas does is it embeds itself in the civilian population and it uses them as shields. Now, I'm going to perform a, uh, a little exercise here. Here is Adam Smith. And um, uh, uh, he is, um, um, all of a sudden I lost you, uh, Patrick. Can you? You're come fine. I, I made you full screen so we could see your puppet. Uh, oh, okay. Um, this is Adam Smith. And here is a knife. It's actually a pen. And I'm coming at you, Patrick, and I'm going to kill you. And I yell, I'm going to kill Patrick. Patrick is evil. He asked me a challenging question, and I can't stand challenging questions, so I'm going to kill you. And I'm faster than you, so you can't run away in any way. Your back is at the wall, and we're in a narrow corridor, so you can't dodge around me. The only thing you can do is either let me kill you or shoot me. However, if you shoot me, you have to go right through Adam Smith, who is an innocent person. What are you going to do, Patrick? Are you going to stand there and let me kill you? Or are you going to shoot me and then take out Adam Smith, who is an innocent person who is right here in, in front of me? Well, I think that if you shoot me, you are not a murderer. You are engaging in self-defense. And yes, this innocent person has to die, but whose fault is it that, it, that this innocent person dies? Is it your fault? No. It's my fault for using him as a shield. And what Hamas does is, as I say, it embeds itself in the civilian population and in effect, it puts children and uh, women in front of it. It puts um, rocket launchers in hospitals. It put, puts rocket sh uh, launchers in the middle of a school and it starts shooting rockets over to Israel. I almost wish that there were no Iron Dome. I'm a little ambivalent about that because if there were no Iron Dome, there'd be none of this um, shooting of rockets. Uh, but with the Iron Dome, they just engage in lawn mowing and, and they don't really uh, kick butt as much as they should. But the point is that whose fault is it that the hospital gets bombed? And when the hospital gets bombed and uh, because there's a rocket launcher in there, uh, innocent people will die. And if you say, well, the Israelis shouldn't then shoot the um, uh, hospital or the school or whatever it is, uh, the market, well, then you're saying that Israel should commit suicide of the very same sort of suicide that you're going to commit when I come at you. With, oh, here's my, my, uh, my knife, my pun my pen, and I'm going to shoot you. You don't have to commit suicide. Uh, uh, libertarianism is not a suicide pact. And uh, the idea, uh, Murray is wrong. Innocent, it is justified to kill innocent people sometimes, especially when they're used as a shield. Should I respond now or let Alan have a crack as well? Let Alan have a crack and then your turn. Let me, okay. let me add just one thing that, uh, again, I think uh, the... Uh, the Steve Horowitz quote that we mentioned, that we included in the reply to Hoppe is relevant. I mean, and uh, you are taking the same position, which is basically you're analyzing the subject from the purely anti-state perspective. But on a comparative basis, you should look at the 
pro liberty side of the equation, which is what uh, specific scenario in reality would lead to more liberty. And uh, to assume that since there is a state, the state of Israel, uh, to make it disappear, that would increase liberty as such, is something that has no foundation in fact whatsoever. Not only because, as you mentioned, uh, the disappearance of a state wouldn't lead to uh, anarcho-capitalist ideal anywhere in the world, because it depends fundamentally on the underlying philosophy of the people and the institutional development of a specific place. Uh, that involves also other types of things like, for example, the insurance industry, etc. But in this particular case, uh, the opposite to the state of Israel, and that's the point, is not an anarcho-capitalist ideal. It's an Islam, Islamist totalitarian regime, uh, Hamas. So. It's, it's not that you have like, uh, you know, the, the alternative that, that would uh, make you feel comfortable with your philosophy. And that's, that's really, it's really, you know, a, it's a very difficult situation because you need to analyze the, the, the real case with something that you can work with in order to see which side is guilty which side is the cause of the entire situation that is leading to such human suffering. And uh, if you're going to, uh, I, I don't mean you, but I mean in general, if uh, someone is going to tackle the issue from the perspective of, of an ideal that is not uh, materially, you know, uh, applied anywhere, uh, the problem is that you will end up without any uh, particular guidelines in order to see if your philosophy works or not. Uh, and we, that, that's the relevant side when we say not to, to not to be relevant, which means not to be heard, but to use the philosophy in order to analyze a real case in the world not to not to be uh, famous or or, or 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 nothing about that that's the sense in which, in which we use the word uh basically that is what i wanted to to add okay i'm gonna probably miss some of the things that you said so i'm gonna i guess i'll try and hit the important points and if i if i miss something you think is important please let me know um oh. stabbing me uh guarded by a, a person um the nature of moral philosophy, the nature of principles is self are our concepts that self limit our behavior. That, that is what it is to be principled is to have a set of rules in your head that limit your options in life for the purpose of, you know, let's say being a good person. So when I'm presented with a flagpole scenario or which, which is kind of what this is, a life raft scenario, uh, the, the principled answer is I would much prefer to die being a good person than live as an evil one. That's the answer. If I have to murder someone to protect myself, I am happy to die on that hill. And I think it is, I, this is not an accusation, but I think it might for some people come from a place of cowardice to not be able to actually embody physically, put their life on the line for what is important to them, for their principles that they go through life espousing. What good is principles if when the metal meets the, when the rubber meets the road, when your life's actually on the line, what good are principles if you're not willing to die for them? And this is the perfect example. Uh, I, well, the, the, the flagpole scenario that, um, uh, what's his name? David Friedman made up uh, exactly the same scenario. Principles are your life. That's the entire point of moral philosophy. What comes first? What's at the top of your value hierarchy? Is it your life or is it your principles? That's what we're talking about here. If I have to murder, go ahead. So, it, well, do you want me to continue to the other points or should we belabor this for a while? Let me, let me just uh, comment on David Friedman and the flagpole. Sure. Uh, um, uh, the situation is you're on the 25th floor and you're leaning over the balcony and you lose your grip and you fall to the 15th floor and happily, there's a, a flagpole there and you're hanging on to the flagpole. 
And what you want to do is go in uh, over uh, hand over hand into the 15th floor house and um, uh, then go up back to the uh, 25th floor, take the elevator back and join your, your party. And uh, there's a lady on the 15th floor who said, and she's got a rifle, and she says, um, drop, because it's my flagpole, my private property rights. And what David Friedman asks is, should you drop? That is not the libertarian question. The libertarian question cannot, that is not a question that a libertarian can answer. The only question that a libertarian can answer is, if this lady shoots you, is she a murderer? It's a very different question. And I think that you and David uh, Friedman are um, misunderstanding libertarian theory. Now, look, this, uh, most people say, well, you know, this lady should let you in, but you look like a rapist who uh, raped her uh, a week ago, and she's scared of you, and she's defending herself. The proper libertarian question is, if she shoots you, is she a murderer? And the proper libertarian answer is no, because private property rights are sacrosanct. Now, what you're doing here is not defending private property rights when you allowed me to kill you because I had uh, Adam Smith in front of me. What you're doing is being a pacifist. Now, being a pacifist is fine, um, but, but that's not the question. The question is not what should you do. The question is, if you shoot me, are you a murderer? And the answer is, you're darn tootin', you're not a murderer, you're engaging in self-defense, and the person who is responsible for poor Adam Smith being killed is not you, it's me. The people that are responsible for what's going on now in uh, Gaza, they say 30,000 uh, innocent people have died, or 35,000 people, which is Hamas numbers, so I don't know if we can uh, take them without a bucket of salt, let alone a little bit of salt. But the question is, who is responsible for those murders? And it's not Israel, because if Israel can't defend itself and root out Hamas, Israel might as well commit suicide. But the question is not uh, should you do anything. The question is, if you do something, are you a murderer? And the answer is the Hamas are the murderers, not the Israelis. I don't think that we can avoid the, f the, uh, the, the fact of reality that our brains are connected to our hands, which would be firing that bullet to kill that person running at us with a knife to stab us. We have a choice that where we have agency, we have culpability. And just like with like economics, it's not a pie to be sliced up. When we create a new business with productive capacity, we're creating new pie. I think culpability works exactly the same way. When we take actions in a criminal situation, it's not like the the, the getaway driver for a bank robbery is 10% culpable for the robbery and the guys that went in and shot somebody and stole the money are 90%. No, no, no. They're all 100% culpable for everything that happened there. Um, same thing for your stab situation. If I shoot the person and murder Adam Smith, we're both culpable for that murder. Now, granted, in, in I think... Um, in a libertarian, let's say, justice system, they would probably put most of the punishment on the stab stabber, the stab stabber, not the stabby. <laughs> Go ahead. You, you look like you want to say something. Go ahead. Uh, I don't think they would put any um, uh, uh, guilt on you. You're just engaging in self-defense, and the murder of Adam Smith is my fault, not your fault. But my brain pulled the trigger. So am I, is my is my hand being remotely controlled? I mean, no, but you can't you can't ignore the rea the reality that I do have a choice. I do not have to shoot. Let, let, let me and, and it, with it. and with choice comes responsibility, at least to some degree. Let let me uh, try to think about it from a different perspective. There are fundamental rights, right? One of those is the right to life which means that you have a right to sustain your life. Now, if the person that is being used as a Forgive shield- me for interrupting. Right. Forgive me for interrupting. for interrupting. Are you arguing from an ANCAP perspective or a classical liberal perspective right now? And, and to be clear for the remainder of the interview, I am only ever arguing from an ANCAP perspective. So I'm not playing on the ballpark of classical liberal. I, I just want to be clear on where you're coming from. I apologize. Well, but I mean, these, uh, these rights are defined and then is uh, the political application that you that you make is the extent to which you apply them so it's not that it, they are either or 
uh, right to life is within the tradition of classical liberalism as well as anarcho-capitalism. So just that, just to to mention, but uh, the idea is that you have a right to life as well uh, as a shield. So uh, the question is, would would you extend the causal sequence to the one that initiated, which is the the, the person that is aggressing against you, and that is using the shield, but you are like uh, framing it in such a way as to reduce the causal sequence just between you and the shield. But that's not how it works because that's not what created the situation. Uh, that, that's how I think it should be framed. But I, I, I just said I that we share it. culpability. So I, I'm not sure that that's a, an accurate. No, critique. but it, it, I mean, if you if you if you say that you share culpability, you in a sense are implying that you don't have a right to life, uh, because it, if you share culpability, that means that you are you. I mean, you should feel guilty for living, and I don't see how that could be uh, compatible with either with classical liberalism or or with anarcho capitalism. Sorry. But uh, I, I get your point any, in any way, but uh, I don't think we're going to agree. We'll have to agree to disagree here. I, I, sh think. I should have asked you before we got started what your stop time is so that I can kind of uh, apportion the show appropriately. So if you guys have another 30 minutes, uh, I'll do it one way. If you guys have five minutes, I'll do it another way. Uh, let me know how long I have, you have like, here. I have 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay. So let's then quickly move on to the conclusion of, of the show which is going to be, and man, look, if you guys want to come back, we can do deep dives on all of these topics and it'll be really fun because <laughs> yeah, I, cool. I love this stuff. All right. So the, the last important thing I would like to discuss with you guys is how we should disagree with fellow libertarians. Um, Hoppe disagree. He went nuclear. I can't imagine words being stronger than the one he, the ones he used. He called, he called you guys unhinged, bloodthirsty monsters rather than libertarians committed to the non-aggression principle. Um, he says that you guys have been disqualified as libertarians. Um, now there's a meme amongst libertarian circles where we're always calling each other not libertarians when we disagree on things, but Haba actually did that. He actually said, look, uh, I'm using my authority card as a, a leader in the libertarian thought space to revoke you y'alls, I say as a Texan, y'alls libertarian cards. Um, what sh okay, so let's say that you guys wrote what you wrote as ANCAPs, not as classical liberals. So you wrote something that actually contradicts ANCAP uh, principles. How should Block have responded? And I'll give that to you first, Alan, and then Walter. No, I, I, I'd say that, uh, look, first of all, anarcho-capitalism is a particular political philosophy. It's not a religion, as is not libertarianism as such. So you need to see where you can apply it or not. For example, if you're dealing with, let's say, uh, mathematics, you wouldn't talk about libertarianism. It's not relevant. And in this particular case, the point is that using anarcho-capitalism as, an, as a tool of analysis is not relevant either because it won't, be, uh, it won't allow you to analyze the subject on a comparative basis, as I said, which is the only relevant, at least, at least for us, way to uh, achieve or to arrive at a conclusion that would lead you somewhere, which means lead you to uh, an evaluation of the situation. So the point is that uh, we are not using anarcho-capitalism precisely because of that. And that's precisely the same reason that Murray Rothbard talks about why he is against sectarianism in that respect. The problem is that uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe, in his open letter, uh, he talks about Rothbard and he says that Walter uh, is like, in a sense, against Rothbard and uh, embarrassing him or whatever. But the point is that that is why we use Rothbard precisely because according to Rothbard, what we are doing, our method of analysis of the situation is compatible with the same that he used on the same subject. 
so I don't see why uh, one needs to say, okay, so from an anarcho-capitalist perspective, you are doing this, you're doing that, because it's not the only way that you can analyze a fact. It's not, it's, I mean, it's, it's not, simply not. Uh, and as I said, I mean, you, even from an anarcho-capitalist perspective, you can see easily that uh, saying that the uh, totalitarian state that Hamas established in the Gaza Strip and the state of Israel, they both disappear and that's going to solve things. It's, it's ridiculous. So uh, basically, that's all I can say about that. I don't know, Walter, if you would like to. Yeah. So, Walter, the question was, if you guys had written that book as ANCAPs, how should Hoppe have responded? What is the proper discourse? Well, if we had written the book as uh, ANCAPs, it would have been a very short book. We would have said Israel is a state. It's no good. There are a bunch of bums. No, no, uh, forgive, forgive the interruption. The, the, I want to clarify the question. If you had written a, 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 that book with all of its classical liberal conclusions as ANCAPs, meaning your book was flawed, because I don't think Hoppe's criticism of your book is valid because he was criticizing it from a place you weren't writing it from. So I'm eliminating that as a variable. If you actually wrote it as ANCAPs and Hoppe had a good foundation to criticize you, how should he have done that is my question. Sorry to interrupt you. No, no, no problem. Well, look, uh, let's just take this conversation. We've been at it for about an hour. None of us have called anyone else unhinged or monstrous or bloodthirsty <laughs> or jerks or, or anything. Give us another 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I threatened to kill you, but, uh, <laughs> but that was a different kind of a threat. Um, we've been amiable with each other. We've been uh, civilized with each other, but we've been scholarly, if I could put, use that word. And I think that's the way to uh, deal with each other. Look, we libertarians disagree on a lot of things. Murray Rothbard is a pro-choice person on abortion. Ron Paul is a pro-life person on abortion. Uh, they're 180 degrees apart. Nobody ever said that either one of them should be kicked out of the libertarian movement. Um, we uh, never a harsh word was ever uttered between the two of them. Uh, we disagree on immigration. We disagree on voluntary slavery. We disagree on reparations to black people for slavery, uh, the great grandchildren of slaves. We disagree on a lot of things as libertarians. Um, Murray used to have this uh, rule, every dog gets one bite. I would say every dog gets five bites. You're still a libertarian if you disagree with me on very complicated issues. Look, if you say we should prohibit marijuana or minimum wage is great or something like that, I might have a problem with you. But uh, there are very complicated issues, and the proper way to interact is scholarly. Look, we're scholars. We believe that the weight of the truth with a capital T is uh, through scholarship. Well, Hans was not scholarly. He was um, vituperative. Um, the, uh, in our response to him, we kept saying things like our honorable colleague, our learned um, scholar, uh, things like that. We were trying to be polite. Uh, to him. Uh, I disagreed with Hans many times on, on other issues, and every time the two of us, when we disagreed, we were polite. Why all of a sudden are libertarians going berserk over this issue? I don't know why, but I know what to call it, and I call it Israel derangement syndrome. For some reason, libertarians have just lost their minds on, on this issue, and they engage in, um, you know, I, I went AWOL, you know, uh, I'm absent without leave. I'm not a libertarian anymore. This is just silly. We disagree on complicated issues because they're complicated and we're imperfect scholars and we're doing our best. But th there's no justification for Hans to use uh, such language. Um, I, I, I think it's just improper and, and, and um, uh, I, I don't know what to say, uh, but, but it, it's certainly incompatible with the way we three treated each other. We disagreed uh, strongly on some issues, and, and we're still friends. And you've invited us on your show again, and we'll be happy to be on your show again because it's an interesting uh, conversation and we're delving into important issues. Uh, Hans should have, um, uh, uh, he, there's nothing wrong with what he said substantively. 
I disagree with it, but what the heck? People disagree. But the vituperation that he used is inexcusable. Okay, so let's um, let's close out the show. Uh, I'll I'll say a few words, then I'll pass it to Alan. Um, and I would like to, I guess, pass it to you with a question, and then you can, you know, say it. I'll give you guys the last word. So Alan and then Walter. Um, okay. This is the important takeaway that I want people to get from this interaction is how to have disagreement amongst libertarians. There's there's too much of this, uh, you're not a libertarian stuff. That's non-helpful. In fact, it's retro-helpful. It hurts our ability to continue refining our ideas. And people, look, our ability to have these debates is why we have the best ideas in the world. Because we've worked on refining them more than everyone else. We, are de we love debates. We love clashing ideas and figuring out what the truth is. And where aggression lies that's our superpower and we have to embrace that but to embrace it we have to do it charitably we have to be focused on truth not on egos and not on who's an actual libertarian that's my that's that's my last word my question to you guys to ask you guys to also have your last word is um where is the line is there a line in which you would say that person is not a libertarian what should be the line that cannot be crossed to to bear that label? So, Alan, you first, and you can say, you know, have the last word, and then Walter, same. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for the invitation, Patrick. It was great uh, talking with you and discussing and debating these issues, which are also, uh, uh, you know, like uh, mind mental ex exercises in order to to further advance towards. The truth with a capital T, as Walter always <laughs> likes to say. But uh, I think that the, the main thing is that libertarianism is a philosophy. So the the thing the, the most important thing to consider is what would be uh, the libertarian perspective on a particular issue, and uh, what would not be the libertarian perspective. And and you can judge from from that standpoint uh how to judge i mean how to uh analyze a situ a particular situation uh but it's not the case that you would label someone uh a libertarian or not a libertarian uh, as a you know as a com as a whole Th there is no such a thing as the libertarian perhaps walter mr libertarian or murray rothler right but now i'm joking i mean what what I what I'm trying to say here is that people have ideas on on different subjects, and with respect to political philosophy, those ideas could be aligned to libertarianism, and in 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 that respect, you you say okay, so this is a libertarian idea, and and uh, that's it basically. But you don't take libertarianism as dogma or as a religion or as a uh, as an organization from which you can uh, kick people out. It doesn't work that way. So the I, at least on this discussion, let's say, if you disagree with us, you could say, well, your idea is not libertarian. But I mean, to to even to 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 claim that Walter Block is is not a libertarian, or I mean, he's one of the creators of the entire philosophy. So I think the entire debate is absurd from this perspective. Uh, and how 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 you should tackle the issue is to say, I disagree with you. I think it's incompatible with libertarianism, what you are saying. And so you debate the, the subject, but you don't treat people like uh, in, in an uncharitable way, as you, as you explained, Patrick. Basically, that's what I would say about it. Walter? Um, I would say there is such a phenomenon called the continuum. What's a continuum problem? We know that if you go to bed with a five-year-old girl, you're a statutory rapist. We don't care whether she agreed or not, because we don't think she's capable of any agreement. We know that if you go to bed with a 25-year-old woman, whatever you are, you're not a statutory rapist, because we believe that 25-year-old women are uh, capable of determining whether they should go to bed with you or not. Well, where do you draw the line? Is it 15? Is it 16? Is it 17, 18? Uh, there's no one um, point at which you can say, well, you're a statutory rapist 
um, if you go to bed with someone over this age or under that age, suppose we pick 16 and a half, not totally unreasonable. Well, uh, but there are 17 year old girls that are less mature than 15 year old girls. And also you can't deduce from, remember the three libertarian principles I mentioned? Uh, non-aggression principle, property rights based on homesteading and free association. You can't deduce a, a, a statutory rape age from any of that. We know it's somewhere around 17 or I'm not sure, I don't want to get in trouble, but uh, it's somewhere around there. Uh, but it's certainly not five years old nor 25. But Patrick, what city are you now in? I'm in Dallas. Dallas. I'm in Vancouver, British Columbia. We're about 2,000 miles away. And in addition to coming at you with a, a, a knife, I'm now going to punch you. How close do I have? Are you uh, justified in sending a, a ballistic missile to my house and killing me? No. <laughs> one, because we're so far away, and two, because of the context. Even if I were one inch from you, you know that I wouldn't hit you. That would be just demonstrating something. But how far do I have to be and in what context before you're able, if you're not a pacifist, and I think you might be a pacifist, but if Definitely you're not a pacifist, not. how close do you have to be? There's no, no uh, line. How do we decide these things? Well, uh, uh, we decide the statutory rape age in some sort of democratic uh, way. And we decide this other stuff when I uh, punch you. Look, if we're, in a, if we're in a dark alley and the light is glinting off my watch and you think it's a knife, it's different. How do we decide that? We decide that on the basis of uh, a jury, uh, of our peers, whether, I'm, uh, whether I initiated violence against you or not. Now to get back to your question. We know that Donald Trump is not a libertarian. If he says he is, he's wrong. We know that uh, Joe Biden is not a libertarian. We know that Chomsky is not a libertarian. We know that Bernie Sanders is not a libertarian. And if they say they are, we just reject it. So you ask, is there any line? No, there's no red line, but it's a continuum. Just as we know that you're a statutory rapist with a five-year-old girl and not with a 25-year-old woman, we know that Bernie Sanders is not a libertarian, nor is AOC, nor is Hitler. And if they said they were, uh, we would reject it just as we would reject the five-year-old girl um, uh, as a legitimate um, uh, uh, interaction. So, so it's a continuum problem. Yes, if you, uh, if you think that uh, we should have rent control and minimum wage and we should uh, prohibit, have the death penalty for uh, using marijuana, you're not a libertarian. You're so far out of it that you're not a libertarian. On the other hand, if you disagree on a very complicated issue like abortion, both Murray Rothbard and Ron Paul are, um, are libertarians, even though they're 180 degrees apart. Uh, that's how I wanted to answer your question. Let me just say in a, a commercial message, I'm a professor at Loyola University, New Orleans. I'm always looking around for good students. So if you're a high school student or your grandchildren are high school students or you're in a college and, and there are no professors there who are libertarians or, or Austrian economists and you want to have uh, an education, you want to become a, a student of mine, Think of um, uh, applying for admission to Loyola University in New Orleans. Very good. Um, I think and I want... What would you say? I missed it? Thanks for having us, and we look forward to being on your show again. I love Thank it. I, I want to call on the Mises Institute to reinstate you. And, and I realize I just stole the last word, so I will give you another opportunity to say something. But I think, I think it's clear that he was not writing as an ANCAP in this situation, which makes the criticisms that have been levied against him invalid from your perspective. He agrees with you on the important points. He's stated as much. He stands by that. I think if you don't re reinstate him, I think I would, I deserve as a follower of the Mises Institute, I want an explanation. Now that we've clarified, hopefully the ground, the, the foundation of that argument. Okay. I stole the last word. So you guys both get another, uh, you know, another moment if you want to say something. No, thank thank you for your invitation, Patrick. It was great. I hope you thank enjoyed. You. I hope you enjoyed the show. I definitely did. I can't wait to talk to you guys again and go really deep on all those cool topics that we talked about. Thanks for thanks for coming on, guys. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoy it. If you agree, disagree, which I'm sure you will, feel free to call me not a libertarian in the comments, and I will see you guys all <laughs> next time. Everybody, peace, love, and anarchy. This